The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. It's the end of March, 1995. Typical weather in Los Angeles with lows in the 50s and highs occasionally into the 80s. Madonna's hit song, Take a Bow, plays on the radio. Forrest Gump dominates the Oscars, winning six statues, including Best Picture. There's a rabies outbreak in Texas. Striking Major League Baseball players offer to end their 232-day strike, and the world loses two music icons, Tejano singer Selena and gangsta rap artist Easy e who dies of AIDS. Reverend Jesse Jackson visits O.J. Simpson in jail and says a prayer for him and the Simpson family. Meanwhile, on the ninth floor of the L.A. County Courthouse, two other families, the Browns and the Goldmans, pray for justice in the murders of their loved ones as the People vs. O.J. Simpson continues. The tenth week of the O.J. Simpson trial signals a change in direction for the prosecution. Marsha Clark goes after her own witness, Cato Kalin, after he becomes evasive on the witness stand. It's a stunning move for the lead prosecutor as the people's case continues to be blunted by the defense. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ25. Ms. Clark, you may resume. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Mr. Kalin, good morning. I think Cato Kalin was the best witness for television. He was ridiculous and charming and, and hard to figure out. Ms. Clark, you may resume with your direct examination. Mr. Kalin, you told uh, Mr. Shapiro that the defendant's demeanor on June the 12th was the same as always. Do you recall saying that? Um, a different points of the, that day. I said that he was tired at one point, point. Mm -hmm. and uh, in the afternoon he was conversational. You remember testifying earlier that Mr. Simpson was upset during that day? The, about a, a statement that was made. A little bit upset, yes. Question by Mr. Shapiro. Did you see anything unusual in his feelings because he couldn't spend as much time with his daughter that he would have liked? No, it was, he just said it. It wasn't unusual. Was he angry? No, not when he said that. Was he agitated? No. You recall giving that testimony? Uh, yes. And yet you just testified that the defendant was upset when he said that. What I, I have trouble with is the upset, the word of what the range is of upset and angry. But yeah, there was like upsetness in the voice. Are you confused about the meaning of the word upset, Mr. Kalen? Is that no, the I, problem? No, no, I, I know what you mean. He wasn't really believable because you kind of got the feeling that he was afraid to testify. Was he upset or wasn't he when he talked about Nicole and her tight dresses? No, not, not real upset. It, he was brought on as a prosecution witness, and he ended up being a hostile witness for the prosecution because they weren't getting what they really wanted out of him. Yeah, I'm going to ask leave of the court to take this witness as a hostile witness. When an attorney calls a witness to the stand, they have to ask open-ended questions. But if that witness is not cooperating and not answering your questions, you can have them declared a hostile witness. And what that really means is, now you don't have to ask those open-ended questions, you can ask leading questions like you do on cross-examination. The defendant was upset when he spoke about the, Nicole wearing the tight dresses at the recital. Um, yes. Now, is it your testimony today that he was more upset about Sydney than he was about Nicole wearing the tight dresses? Yes. But that was not your testimony before, was it, Mr. Kalin? No. When it became apparent that Mr. Kalin was going to be treated as a hostile witness, again, it started giving me the inf inference that he's just not giving her the answers that she assumed they had already agreed to beforehand. And all of this stuff leads to me having reasonable doubts as to what he was talking about or, or the testimony that he was giving. Earlier, you testified that he was relaxed and nonchalant when he spoke about Sydney at the recital. Isn't that true? That's what I remember, yes. And isn't it also true that you testified previously during this trial 
that he was more upset about Nicole wearing the tight dresses than he was about not being able to see Sydney. Isn't that true? Uh, yes. And now you're changing that testimony. Is that what you're doing, sir? Uh, I, yes. Would you describe what you would mean when you were saying somebody is upset? Um, um, Nicole didn't let me see Sydney. I want to see my daughter. I want to see her. And, uh, oh, boy. I don't know, Cato. I don't know how they can wear these tight outfits. They're, it's, uh, if they're going to be grandmas one day, I mean, can they wear those? Was that the can, tone of voice? Can, um, actor, sorry. The, uh, more of a... Having spoken no, to was, Cato was, in the years sorry. since, I believe Cato Kalin was afraid to say what he really felt. I really do. Are you here to tell the truth? Yes. Are you doing your best to tell the truth? Yes. Court TV producers kept thousands of pages of notes during the trial. On this day, one observation describes Cato's no-win situation. Cato Kalin was trying to please Clark by giving her the answer she wanted. I thought the same thing with Shapiro. This was a witness who wanted desperately to give both lawyers the answers they wanted. He was clearly not enjoying being controversial or being thought of as a liar. He liked O.J. Simpson, but he was also Nicole's friend. And I think he believed that O.J. Simpson committed this crime, but he was terrified to be a prosecution witness. Isn't it true that when O.J. Simpson said to you, Thank God I was with you, that he seemed to be relieved. Testimony. Sustained. For his question. Has he ever asked you to create an alibi for him or lie for him? No. Mr. Kalin, who has approached you? Everyone. Every tabloid. How much money have you been offered? A lot, um, close to a million, I guess. Have you accepted any money from any tabloids for your story? No. They dumped every human being who knew really nothing about the case onto the witness stand and created characters like Cato Kalin. Sir, as of June the 12th, can you tell us where you were employed? Uh, I was employed for Town and Country Limousine. Did you have an order for a pickup on that date for the evening to go to the airport? Uh, yes, I did. What was your order? Uh, my order was to pick up Mr. Simpson at 360 Rockingham. At what time? Uh, 10.45. How were you able to locate which house on Rockingham was the defendant's as you drove up Rockingham? Uh, there was addresses on the, painted on the curb. The limo driver Alan Park's testimony stands out significantly to me and to the point where I can almost recall his testimony. At the time that you were looking at that location, the address on the curb, did you see a car parked in that location? No, I didn't. You see that white Bronco in this photograph, sir? Yes. Was that white Bronco there at the time you drove by at about 1022? I didn't see it. And you were looking at that curb, were you not? Yes. When you saw the address on the curb, what had happened next? What did you do? Uh, I was driving a little bit quick, so by the time I saw it, uh, I noticed that was the house, and uh, I should turn around. As I got a little bit farther, uh, I noticed another side street, Ashford. It was around 10.39. I drove up to the Rockingham Gate, looking down the Rockingham driveway, and pulled up to the Ashford Gate. Did you notice any white Ford Bronco parked to either side of that Ashford gate? No, I didn't. Can you tell us what time it was? 
That was at 1040 when I got out of the car and there was an intercom at the gate and uh, I was using that intercom to buzz the, the house. He said the house was dark, no one was there. The limo driver is ringing uh, or calling inside for him to come down to the limo for 14 minutes. Did something attract your attention? Yes, a uh, white male walked from behind the house area on a pathway and uh, he had a flashlight in his hand and he stopped before he got to the driveway. And that person that you're describing, have you since learned what his name is? Yes. And what is his name? Uh, Cato. Now at the same time that you saw Cato Kalin in the side yard, did you see anything else? I saw a figure come into the uh, entranceway of the house just about where the where the driveway starts. Can I ask the court to ask the defendant to stand for a moment, please? Thank you. You've seen the defendant, Mr. Park? Yes. Can you tell us if that appears to be the size of the person that you saw enter the front entrance of the house at Rockingham? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Lopez. Oh, Lopez. Yes, around the, around the size. He saw him sometime around 11 o'clock. And moving in what direction, sir? Into the house or towards the house. Could you tell whether that person was coming from the Rockingham driveway or from the area of the garage, from the south pathway? No, I couldn't. How long after that person entered the house, the front entrance, did the lights go on downstairs? Just seconds. That's when I got back up and out of the car and rang the intercom. This time there was an answer, uh, which was Mr. Simpson. He told me that, uh, that he overslept and uh, he just got out of the shower and he'd be down in a minute. I got back into the car and waited another 20, 30 seconds and, uh, before uh, Mr. Kalen came over and opened the gate. Did you pull into the driveway after Mr. Kalen opened the gate? Yes, I did. Do you remember if he asked you a question? Yeah. Okay. He asked me if, uh, if I felt an earthquake. Oh. All right. Sustained. Sustained right. what? It's hearsay. Uh, the front door was open, and there were uh, a couple of bags on the porch. Do you remember what kind of bags were on the porch? Uh, black duffel bags. At that point, I concluded in my mind, I'm saying, well, there we go. That explains why he was standing at the front door. He just brought the bags out and sat them there. Can you tell us, sir, approximately how long it was between the time you saw the six foot, 200 pound person dressed in all dark clothing go into the house and the time you saw Mr. Simpson come out the front entrance? It was somewhere around five and six minutes. And when you had the conversation with Cato uh, at the front entrance, sir, did you happen to notice whether he had anything in his hands? Yeah, he had a flashlight. What happened next? Uh, he carried down a, uh, what looked like a Gucci bag with him that f folded in half, seemed to be some type of garment bag. He, uh, he came out and set that on the ground next to the bags, from what I remember. And uh, from there, I picked it up and, and put that into the trunk. Uh, did something ever occur with the duffel bag that you saw in the uh, front entrance when you first pulled up? Yes, as Mr. Simpson was walking by one of the times, I asked him where he'd like those bags uh, in the trunk or inside the car. Uh, he asked me to put them inside the car. And did you do that, sir? Yes, I did. There was another bag on the driveway. What kind of bag was that? It was another, seemed to be small duffel bag. We were standing around the car and uh, Mr. Simpson came back out. Cato offered to go get the bag. And uh, he said, no, no, that's okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. I don't know if he put it inside or, or in the trunk.
Mr. Cochran. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Farr. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon sir. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions, if I might, sir. Um, how long had you been a lim limousine driver as of June 12, 1994? Uh, for about five months. Uh, tell us, when did you first meet uh, Ms. Marsha Clark, uh, the district attorney at the far end of the table? The, f the first time? I, don't, I, I really don't remember. Was it back in June of 1994? Yes. And it would be a fair statement to say you talked and gave a statement to police officers um, Tippin and Carr on or about June 15th, 1994. Isn't that correct? Yes. Now, that night, you saw Mr. Simpson for at least a period, um, 1055 or thereabouts, until you dropped him off at the, uh, or left him at the airport there at about 1135. Isn't that correct? Yes. And, and would I be correct in assuming that what you were most concerned with that particular evening was uh, finding out if Mr. Simpson was at home, getting him so you could get to the airport? Is that your concern? Yes. At that time, um, it, it wasn't so important to you, I presume, as to what cars were parked where on the street. That wasn't important to you, was it? No, not at all. Do you remember telling uh, officers Tippin and Carr that you didn't recall seeing a car parked in front of the residence when you stopped near the Rockingham Gate? Remember telling him that? Yes. In my mind, I'm right then and there, I'm saying to myself, if he could say for sure that he knew that the Bronco was there or not there, it would have given me information to the point where I could assume that maybe either Mr. Simpson was or was not at home. Now, during this period of time, you had occasion, did you not, to see Mr. Simpson's hands, didn't you? Yes. In fact, uh, you described for us that at one point you shook his hand, his right hand, is that correct? Yes. All right. And uh, you saw him, I think you've described for us, coming down the stairs carrying some bags with, with his hands, isn't that correct? Yes. And uh, did you ever see any band-aids on, on, on his left hand, on his left knuckle, uh, middle finger here? No. Uh, you didn't see any cuts on his hands that, that evening, did you? No. And you didn't see Mr. Simpson bleeding that evening, did you? No. Of all the evidence in this case, the biggest question I always had was about the cut on the finger. If it could have been determined that the finger was actually cut during the, the commission of the murders, I think that would have had an overwhelming effect on me as, as far as for his guilt or innocence. After Mr. Simpson got out, and although his plane was leaving in about 10 minutes, uh, somebody approached him and asked for an autograph? Yes. And did you see him accommodate that individual? Yes, he did. And did he sign the autograph? Yeah. Yes. Uh, he also took the time to uh, to ask you or to tell you to add 20% to the bill? Yes. There was no, all the luggage had been taken out of the car, is that correct? Yes. There was no blood in the back of that car, was there? No. No blood on the carpet of that car, was there? No. They never found the knife. They never found bloody clothes. They never found the shoes. Do I think that he intentionally went there to kill her? Being that you have gloves, a hat, disguise, a weapon, chances are that's what you're going to do. Mr. Park has told the court at sidebar and he's told the jury as well that he did not get a good look at the bag. Uh, his memory is somewhat vague as to what the bag looked like exactly. I mean, it could be, it couldn't be. Where does that get us? How is that relevant? And so we would object to, to presenting that bag to the jury. I mean, is it their contention that, that, that the witness carried that bag on the plane? If not, then they're acting in bad faith. Why introduce it to the witness? This is supposed to be a search for the truth, and we shouldn't be trying to trick witnesses uh, to get them to say something uh, well, uh, uh, that might affect their credibility. Nobody seems to, to be what they're trying to do. Nobody's trying to trick anybody. With, with all their search warrant powers and all the things they did, they never even tried to find these bags. Just talk about it and throw all these theories up. So let's not talk about trying to trick anybody. We shouldn't be trying to trick witnesses. Right. I noted the objection. I sustained the objection. Unless I hear a better foundation, 
Uh, I've indicated that I'm sustaining. Okay. And as usual, they're trying to give a soundbite for what might be what he hopes is going to happen. Their whole case is based upon hopes and dreams, and they're, and they're evaporating. Nobody calls us the dream team, Mr. Cox. There was so much attention paid to the so-called dream team of the defense that they were constantly trying to figure out what the dream team would do to counter their argument, and they were, they were overthinking everything. The idea that uh, it's very hard for the prosecutors to ever argue anything without uh, labeling everything. The trickery comes from these these vague theories that change like the weather. All Jack, we're asking to do... Is that not a gr gratuitous personal I'm, attack? I'm, re was not, I'm referring to his remark about yeah, trickery. Stop. Right. See you. This matter was brought up by the prosecution. They've made great statements. You know, could Mr. Darden please sit down and stop making sounds while I'm... That's true. Why don't you have a seat, Mr. Darden? Was I making sounds? I'm yes, sorry. you were going, uh, uh, uh. It's a nervous... <laughs> yes. No, I was going, uh, mm, mm. When That's you sit down, now it's that nervous twitch, so please. <laughs> may I, may I? I thought it was, uh, uh, It was, uh, uh, uh. uh. We, we always said, uh, 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 you got Yeah. I, now. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, Your Honor, may I proceed? Yes. You described for us earlier he was carrying some sort of a bag. Do you recall that? Yes. And uh, what kind of bag was that? Uh, it was a garment bag that uh, resembled the Gucci pattern, Gucci bag pattern. Right. Let me, you've been saying Gucci pattern. Do you, do you know the difference between Louis Vuitton and, and, and Gucci? <laughs> no. All right, if, if I were, you don't, do you? Okay, I'm trying to see. Don't look at me. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Somebody here has one, but I... <laughs> uh, have you ever seen those bags with those little LVs on them that are kind of brown? Uh, LV standing for Louis Vuitton? Uh, I can't say I have. All right. If you were to ever see any of these bags again, do you think you'd recognize them? Yes. Mr. Park, I want to place the defendant's 1062 before you. And why don't you just take a minute and take a look at that? It's very similar, if not the bag. All right. Defendant's 1063 being brought by Mr. Uh, Douglas. Do you recognize uh, this bag at all? No. Somewhat similar, but I don't think it's the same. It looks very similar. It looks very similar? Yes. So uh, this could have well been one of the uh, black duffel bags that were out in front of the Simpson home um, from the entranceway. Is that correct? That's correct. Does this look similar to any of the either one of the black bags you saw there that particular night? No, not that I remember. Mr. Williams, you don't recall ever seeing Mr. Simpson anywhere near that trash can on June the 12th, do you, sir? Yes, he was standing near the trash can. Could O.J. Simpson have gotten rid of his blood-soaked clothes and the knife after the murders? That's what the prosecution is trying to get the jurors to believe. Next, the baggage handler who checked in Simpson's luggage takes the stand. A little bit nervous? <laughs> yeah. All right. It won't is, be bad. Would you like is, to your own? Yeah, is the water fresh? Mm -hmm. It's from someone else. Can I have some water? <laughs> I'm thirsty. The water out there is hot. <laughs> All right, Ms. Clark. Sir, as of June the 12th, 1994, where were you employed? At uh, LAX, at American Airlines, where I'm, I'm a sky cap. And on the date of June the 12th, 1994, uh, did you start work at 7 p.m.? Yes, I did. And were you still at work at about 11.30 p.m.? Yes, I was. So who was pushing the luggage carrier, sir? Uh, the Caucasian man. And was there someone else with that uh, young Caucasian man? Well, I didn't notice the other, I didn't notice the other person at first. He was standing like out of my sight. When I first turned, I was facing the podium, helping the people I was helping. And then after I finished with them, I turned to my left and I asked him if he needed help. And then that was at that time that I noticed through my peripheral vision, I could see someone else standing there and it was. Could you see who that was? Uh, yes. Who was that? Mr. Simpson. Is that someone you see in court today, sir? Yes. Okay. Can you point him out? Mr. Simpson. Okay. Indicating the defendant. Thank you. All right. Now, did you um, did you personally check any of the um, bags uh, for uh, the young man or Mr. Simpson? Yeah, I checked two bags. What bags did you check? 
the golf club and the, like, hanging bag. Was Mr. Simpson carrying anything when you saw him? Yes, he had a bag. What kind of bag? Uh, like a little duffel. Duffel bag. Okay. Can you tell us if this is the, uh, this looks like the bag you saw him carrying that night? Mm, yes. Can you tell us if this was the bag he was carrying that night? I couldn't tell you if it was the bag. Looks like. Looks like it. Could you tell us if it appeared to be full or empty? Uh, it, it has something in it. I'm not sure what, but I mean, you know, it didn't, it wasn't weighing him down or anything like that. And he had that on his shoulder? Yes. Did he check that bag in with you? No. What did he do with that bag? He kept it with him. Is there a uh, trash can anywhere near your stand where you work? Uh, yes, just to the left of it. The only duffel bag you saw was the one he carried in over his shoulder? When you're up, over. Oh, you can ask the question. Oh, uh, yeah, that's the only one I saw. Well, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Mr. Williams, you don't recall ever seeing Mr. Simpson anywhere near that trash can on June the 12th, do you, sir? Yes, he was standing near the trash can. Did you see him do anything with the trash can? No, I didn't see him do anything with the trash can. We know that on the night of the murder, he flew to Chicago and came home, um, and these bloody clothes were nowhere to be found. He's watching the trial, he gets pissed off, he calls me in the office and tells me the story. As I took him to Marsha, and I said, you wanna know where the, the shoes are or the knife? This guy sold you, stuffing them in a trash container. That witness was there to pick up his wife, who was a flight attendant, at the same airline. And where's that little half moon shaped travel bag? Nobody knows. We know what was in that travel bag. Can we prove it? No, it's gone forever. But if I'm on the jury, I want to hear. I want to hear what this witness has to say. You never, however, have too much evidence in a murder case. Ever. You put everything on. Balls of the walls. If it doesn't go, it doesn't go. Marcia did not want to appear in bed with the LAPD in front of this jury because it was about Rodney King. It was about the LA riots, some of the most deadly riots in this city's history, in this nation's history. Nobody in that jury liked these cops. If you can truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Please have a seat in the witness stand and state until your first line to use for the record. Judge Wong, you are a... Uh... Retired Superior Court Judge, sir? That's correct. Okay. And in connection with this, with this case, you've been acting as a special master, is that right? That is also correct. Okay. And what is a special master, Judge? A special master is a person who uh, is appointed to carry out certain specific assignments. And were you given an assignment uh, directing you to retrieve certain items on March 28, 1995? That is, that is correct. Okay. You recognize that bad? Yes, I recognize it. And you covered that bag yesterday? Yes. From where, sir? This was from the uh, second story uh, master bedroom. It was in a closet. And was that bag pointed out to you by Mr. Kardashian? Yes. I was producing a segment for a late night news show called Premier Story. It was supposed to be a look at what was going on outside O.J. Simpson's mansion the day after the murders. We caught Robert Kardashian slipping off with O.J. Simpson's garment bag, and that bag was bulging with Simpson's stuff. What was in that garment bag? No one ever knows. And while the garment bag was brought into court, it was brought into court empty. So why not ask Robert Kardashian? Well, interestingly enough, Robert Kardashian was a member of O.J. Simpson's legal team. He knew me as an attorney from the day we met, and in fact, we'd always done business deals together, and in those deals, most of the time, I acted as, as his attorney. So from his standpoint, I don't think it mattered whether I was active or inactive. 
As far as the client knew, I was an attorney. He was there primarily because he'd known OJ for so long and knew a lot of the little facts and details that we would need to know in just terms of history. These are some of the two to 3,000 letters we get every day for OJ. He reads uh, as many as we could get to him. We get a lot of Bibles, we get a lot of books, a lot of, uh, a lot of encouraging cards. Some people will send in money, some will send uh, little tokens of affection. I knew Nicole from the first time O.J. met her, and so I've lost a friend also. I am on his side because I know he didn't do it, but also I want to find out who did do it. Robert Kardashian was kind of an enigma because he was quote unquote part of the defense team, but he never spoke. He never made an argument. He never questioned witnesses. He was there as O.J. Simpson's support. And we always though wondered about him. As we all know, Robert Kardashian, you know, had been a friend of O.J.'s before um, uh, Chris Kardashian had sold her daughter's sex tapes. And before keeping up with the Kardashians, that was their claim to fame that they were friends of the Simpsons. And I think that if you didn't have O.J. Simpson, you wouldn't have the Kardashians. You know, everybody always thinks Nicole is like part of this Kardashian clan where it's like fame and fortune and fanciness and you got to keep in mind 25 years ago we didn't have what we see today we didn't have the housewives we didn't have you know keeping up with the kardashians it's feeling a lot better now thank you, thank you. the media frenzy was off the bat crazy uh, oj simpson obviously at the time was a big celebrity and from then on it was the biggest story in the world it seemed like this appetite had been whetted and once you turn on that faucet, it's tough to turn it off. I think it's a weird progression. And we're kind of, <laughs> it's everything, I think you could trace everything back to O.J. Simpson. That's when society began to fall apart in some strange way. I recently found an old reporter's notebook of the beginning of the case. And I, I realized that I had spelled Kardashian wrong. So it was like innocent times, didn't know how to spell Kardashian. The O.J. Simpson trial is called the trial of the century for a reason. I think it's more complex than people talk about it. Uh, and I think there's always right for discovery, which is why you see so many people still doing work around it. There's cameras in the courtroom, all the lawyers play to the cameras and gonna draw out their arguments. This is all about the cameras. Put your right hand, please. You can spell this way that the testimony you may give and the cross-nails before this court should be the truth of all truth and nothing but the truth, so we'll be back. D-E-N-N-I-S-F-U-N-G. Cameras in the courtroom affects testimony. People that were testifying in the case had never been in front of a jury in their lives, and they're testifying live in front of 50 million people. What time did you arrive at the Rockingham location? I arrived there at 7, 10 in the morning. What are they thinking about? How they look and what am I going to say? I don't want to say the wrong thing. It affects testimony. Testimony is evidence. It affects the outcome of this case. I felt the glove evidence was very, very significant. The glove evidence in and of itself dispelled any notion of conspiracy. Could you now open the box for us and describe what you're doing for the record? Thank you. I am using a pocket, or pocket knife to cut the tape along the top seam of the box. I'm opening up the box. There's a bag within with the item number nine. Is there anything about the packaging that you recognize? 
Yes. In black, I see the item number that I wrote on it and my initials. And is that what you assigned to the uh, number, the, the glove that was found on the south side of the Rockingham location? Yes, it is. Got three types of blood on the glove at Rockingham, both victims and Simpson. That pretty much ties them together. A damning evidence. There's nothing exculpatory about that blood. I'm cutting along the bottom edge of the bag. And within the bag is a glove. And does that appear to be the item that you retrieve from the Rockingham location? Yes, it is. All right. It was a very unique glove. And the fact that we had the left-hand glove found at the Bundy crime scene and a blood-saturated right-hand glove found beneath the uh, air conditioning platform at Simpson's Rockingham house, I felt was very key evidence. Now, when you saw this item prior to you, collect, you collecting it, which, whichever technique you used, uh, what did the item appear like? The item appeared to have some brownish, reddish stains. You testify that, in your opinion, it was more likely to be dry than wet? Yes. And why do you think that? My experience with bloody clothing and their appearance lent me to that estimation of whether it was wet or dry. It appeared to me to be dry. When you first glanced at it, how shiny did it appear? There were just some areas that had a sheen to them. You're saying that Detective Furman volunteered and he rushed down that south walkway. He was the fellow that went down there and he picked up the evidence. At my request. Counsel, you want to state your appearances for the record? Robert Glazier, Commissioner Simpson. You failed. A fire check. Now, you indicated on direct examination that you were the person that went back and uh, recovered the glove item number nine. Yes. And you were the person that was doing all this investigating on the walkway leading up to item number nine. Thanks. Oh, well. Investigation in what sense? Well, you were looking for red stains, you were looking for fibers, you were looking for clues along the south walkway leading up to the glove. Yes. I went by myself and Detective Furman went on the other side of the fence. So, in other words, you were walking down the south walkway and Detective Furman was walking on the other side of the fence. And then it was Detective Furman that pointed at this blue object on the other side of the fence. He went over to help me collect it so I wouldn't have to walk all the way around. But wait a second, you're the criminalist, right? Yes. And you're saying that Detective Furman volunteered and he rushed down that south walkway. He walked down that south walkway, right? I don't know if he rushed or walked. All right. He was the fellow that went down there and he picked up the evidence. At my request. When you're investigating a case or presenting a case to a jury, you want to bring it in different phases. First, you've got motive, because the jury wants to know why would this person want to kill someone? In this case, you're talking about domestic violence, jealousy, clear potential motives. Then you've got opportunity. And this is where the timeline comes into play. Did that suspect, O.J. Simpson, have an opportunity to commit this crime? Then finally, you've got to move into the evidence phase, where you've got to link that suspect to the crime itself. And in this case, in the O.J. Simpson case, it's all about the blood. We're about to enter the technical phase of the case.
let me just address the uh, uh, this first point because I think it's an absolutely essential one, and it's one that uh, uh, highlights the way pro the prosecution is proceeding here that I think has been uh, unfair and abusive in terms of uh, why DNA evidence ought to be presented, and a matter that I think uh, is of extraordinary consequence in terms of how this kind of evidence is going to be presented uh, to juries uh, from this point forward, not just in this courtroom, I think, but uh, uh, across the country, indeed across the world. It was really new evidence at the time. People don't remember in the mid-90s, it was DNA evidence was pretty new. We didn't have all sorts of CSI shows, and, and I don't think the public was as familiar with DNA evidence. What we waived was we waived our right to attack outside the presence of the jury all DNA test results that had been done up to that point that we had received results from. We had ongoing DNA testing. So that was an evolving state of affairs for the, through the first few months of the prosecution. They seem to be taking the position that they are free because of our withdrawal of the motion to prevent, present any DNA evidence in any form. They have all the people here in California that have been from the very beginning trying to uh, engineer the admission of this evidence in favor of the prosecution. The defense team had every intention, regardless of any kind of ruling by you, of parading all sorts of unreliable hearsay in through cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses. DNA evidence is statistical, and you should not be able to present this evidence without statistics. Now, the prosecution has already done that in the opening statement, where Ms. Clark uh, went on saying, here's a bloodstain match. Here's a bloodstain match. Matches the defendant. Matches the defendant. Matches the defendant. Matches the defendant. It's not like they don't know what they're doing, Your Honor. They have all the people here in California that have been from the very beginning trying to uh, engineer the admission of this evidence in favor of the prosecution, the proponents of it, and they know the law. Ms. Clark never misrepresented anything in her presentation. If they really are going to call him, perhaps they get him in a detox center for a period of time so that when he testifies, I, I won't be able to ask him. Wait, wait, wait. No, I, wait. you know, if you want to come in here and talk about science, well, you better be prepared to be put under a microscope and have your entire uh, character subject to attack. He'll be a blip on the radar screen. He's not going to sit up there and testify because he has nothing meaningful to add about the actual reliability of our test results. Would the Nobel Prize Committee have taken back Dr. Mullis's Nobel Prize had they suspected that he'd used LSD when he lived in Berkeley? I doubt it. The last time I looked in the California Evidence Code, we didn't have an exception for Nobel Prize winners. be a blip on the radar screen. He's not going to sit up there and testify. The jury has now heard about Simpson's movements on the night of the murders. But are they buying the prosecution's version of events? Coming up, blood evidence takes center stage in the trial of the century. That's next on OJ25. I'm Roger Kosak. <laughs>